Hi, I am Ellen Chalmers and I teach the Bible. So thanks for joining on. We are in the fourth chapter of Ruth. And if you haven't read, uh, followed along, I have three other chapters of Ruth on YouTube. So you can just go over there and click. But if not, I'll give you a quick review and then we'll jump into chapter four. Uh, so the story of Ruth is about a family. You have Naomi, Elimelech, and their two sons. And they were living in Bethlehem in Israel, and there was a famine in the land. And when the famine happened, they weren't able to have food, so they moved to Moab. And when they were in Moab, the two sons take Moabites as their wives. And uh, during that time, they were there for 10 years, and Naomi's husband, Elimelech, dies, and then the two sons die. So now she, uh, Naomi is with these two daughters-in-law, and so she tells them, it's better for you to stay here in Moab because she has heard that the Lord has visited the land back in Bethlehem and has blessed it and that there's food there. And so she says, it's better for you ladies, you women, to stay here with your, your families um, and not follow me back to Bethlehem. So one of the, the daughters-in-laws listens, and then the other one, who is Ruth, says, no, I am not going back. I'm going with you. And she gives this covenant, this beautiful speech to her, saying, wherever you go, I'm going to go. Your people are going to be my people. Your God is going to be my God. And so Ruth is a faithful woman who stays loyal to Naomi. So they enter back into the, the land of Bethlehem in Israel. And there, uh, there is a law that the Lord has created to provide for people who are poor or on the fringes. And what that law is, is the, um, it's the law of gleaning. And so if you owned land and you had a harvest, your people could go through once to collect the harvest and everything else would be left for those who are destitute. So the widow, the orphan, the sojourner, the alien. And so uh, Naomi and Ruth are widows. And so they were able to go and collect uh, the harvest. And they knew of a family member, Boaz, um, so someone who is kin to Elimelech, uh, Naomi's previous hu husband, and they knew that uh, the field that Boaz owned, that Ruth could be to, could, could go there. So in chapter two, that's what we, we see. We see Boaz, uh, this character that comes onto scene, the owner of these fields, and Ruth is the one that goes and gleans. And everyone knows about her because she's this foreigner and um, who's been faithful to Naomi. And uh, Boaz, it's a beautiful scene where Boaz says to her, um, I want you to stay in my fields. I want you to glean here because I've learned of what kind of woman you are and you are faithful and you are of noble character. And so Ruth is able to go back to Naomi and say, I have found favor in the sight of uh, Boaz. In chapter three, we have this really weird scene um, because it's out of context for our culture. But again, the Lord created a law to protect uh, those who may be out in the fringes, less um, such as women, if they don't have a husband. And this law was the Leverite marriage law. And in chapter three, Ruth and Naomi, they realize that Boaz could be, become a kinsman redeemer. And the Leverite law was that anyone who is close, if, if a woman is married and she does not have any offspring, any sons from that marriage and they die, then what could happen is that a brother could marry uh, the woman. And so Elimelech uh, doesn't have any brothers, or maybe he does, but they, they realize that Boaz might be a cousin or an uncle, um, someone in the family. And by the law, he has to marry Ruth. And if he says no, then somebody maybe else in the family could marry Ruth. 
And so that's the, the scene of chapter three, is Ruth going to Boaz on the threshing floor of the wheat and barley harvest and saying, you are a kinsman redeemer. You can marry me. And Boaz's response to her was that you are a, a woman of character. And yes, I would want to do this, but there's another kinsman that's closer that could be a redeemer. And I need to check with him before I say yes. So chapter four, here we go. I'm reading out of the ESV Bible and if the words will be on the screen. Verse one, now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there and behold, the redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So the gates of the city is where the town meetings would take place. The men that were in power and would make decisions would be sitting in front of those gates. And so Boaz, he collects 10 men of noble character and he brings them there to make the judgment and also goes to the, re the kinsman redeemer that could potentially redeem Ruth. And he talks to him. Verse three, then he said to the redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know for there is no one besides you to redeem it and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. So what happened there was Boaz says, there is this land that belonged to Elimelech and the women, they can't own the land, but the land can be redeemed. It can be bought back and used inside the family. And he says that there is land from Elimelech that you can have because you are a kinsman redeemer. And he says, oh, that sounds great. I want land. Yes, I'll, I'll take it. And then Boaz throws kind of the trump card. He says, well, if you do this, then you are going to acquire Ruth, the Moabitess. And we don't know for what reason we can speculate. Uh, maybe he already had sons and that he didn't want to share the inheritance uh, of his property. We're not really sure why, but he says, nope, I don't want to marry Ruth and I can't do it. You can do it. Verse seven, now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and to Malon. Also, Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. So we have Boaz recapping what's taking place. He's saying, I... You are my witnesses, and I have today redeemed and bought back the land of Elimelech, as well as I'm going to marry Ruth. And he says, I have bought to be my wife. And Jesus, he uses the same words in the New Testament. It talks about how Jesus buys us, his bride, Christ, buys us with his own blood. And so I've said this in the previous uh, studies, but Boaz is a archetype or a picture or a foreshadow of Christ, um, and of Jesus buying a Moabite 
wife, a Gentile bride, and marrying her to redeem her. And isn't that what Jesus did to, for us? He died on the cross, and with his blood, he purchased us. And yes, first to the Jew, but also to the Gentile. And this is what's interesting. These little pictures of the Holy Spirit showing up in scripture thousands of years ago before Christ was even uh, conceived. But we see that in chapter four, the main player here is Boaz and Naomi. Naomi and Ruth becomes kind of a passive player in the chapter four. Ruth was very active in chapters one, two, and three. And so there's speculation, but also um, scholars, they believe what is, is showing is that there's going to be a time of the Gentiles, which we know in Romans 11 is a thing. It's, it's a very true um, fact that we are in a season that the Gentile church will come to harvest and come into knowing salvation of knowing Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And then there will be a time for the Israel to be um, redeemed again. And that Jesus is going to come back and he's going to sit on a real throne in the real physical land of Israel. And so we see that Ruth was bought and purchased as a wife, but Naomi also is blessed because of this transaction. Verse 11, then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrath and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. And so these people are blessing Boaz and Ruth and their marriage and saying that your offspring, may they be like Rachel and Leah, who created the 12 tribes of Israel through their, their line, through their seed. And then this weird uh, blessing also with Tamar and Judah. If you know the story, it's in Genesis 38, where it's another Leverite marriage where Tamar was married to Judah's uh, son and he died and wasn't able to give her an off, a, a son. So she marries the next brother and then he does a wicked thing and God kills him and so she doesn't have a son. And then another son did the same exact thing. And, um, and so eventually uh, Judah said, well, I'll give you this other son when he comes to age. Well, he came to age, Judah forgot. So Tamar, uh, disguises herself as a prostitute, a cult prostitute, and tricks him into having sex with her. And then they, she is pregnant with Perez. Um, and so Tamar would have been uh, killed because of what she had done, but she tricked Judah in a way that she had, um, I think his staff and um, something that belonged to him. And so when they were brought her before Judah and he said, she said to the man that belong these is the son inside my womb. And he said, you are more righteous than I. And so instead of killing her, she was allowed to live and her, her offspring is in the line of Jesus. So they bless her. Maybe it's because it's another Leverite marriage. We're not exactly sure, um, but there's a blessing that they speak over her. Verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons has given birth to him. So Naomi is a key player in this story, that she is the one that receives the blessing. Yes, Ruth does too, but also Naomi, she's, she's being blessed that this life that's coming, I mean, just imagine your husband dying, your, your son's dying, and then, yes, there's, it's the silver lining in this hope uh, at the very end of the story that she has a grandson who's going to be able to 
uh, carry on her legacy and her name. Verse 16, then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. So Ruth was the great, great grandmother of King David. And also we know in Matthew from the genealogy of Christ that David um, is in the line of Jesus as well as um, Obed, their, their son. Um, verse 18, now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron fathered Ram, Ram fathered Amminadab, Amminadab fathered Nashon, Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. So one last thing I just want to point out is that Boaz, um, his father is Salmon. And Salmon, if you go back into Joshua, you'll find out is one of the spies that went into Jericho. And he marries Rahab. And Rahab, Tamar, Rahab, um, and Ruth are all mentioned in the genealogy in Matthew. Um, and so Rahab was, again, a prostitute in Jericho and she took in the spies um, and hid them from the people of Jericho because she knew that she had heard the stories of God redeeming the people out of slavery in Egypt and bringing them over and how the power of God was with them and Rahab knew that God is a God I fear and I want to follow. And so they saw her faith and they, they spared her life when they came in and took over Jericho. And Salmon, one of the spies, uh, marries her and they, fought, they have a, a son and that is Boaz. So I'm just thinking that Boaz grew up with a woman, uh, with a mom that was a Gentile woman as well as a prostitute. And so I think Boaz probably had a soft spot in his heart for Ruth of this, I want to redeem a, a woman that has maybe has gone through a lot um, and wants, like I just see such a connection with families um, in this story. And so this is such a powerful an important story for us to know, and it's it's beautiful too. And one of the uh, seasons that the Jewish people read the Book of Ruth is in the season of Shavuot, and that's the the Feast of Weeks. And what that is is um, when the when God rescued the people out of Egypt, out of slavery, he brought them not directly to the promised land, but he brought them to Mount Sinai and gave them the Torah, the law, the 10 commandments. And he brought and he put his presence with the people of God and created the tabernacle and gave them the, the commands of how to steward his presence and how to take care of his presence. Um, and so the people of God, of the Jews, read the book of Ruth during the, the feast of Shavuot because it's in the feast of the barley and the wheat harvest and the first fruits. Um, and so they read this time, this book during that time. And as Christians, why it's so important, yes, the law was given and we know the Lord through the word of God that was given, but we also know the, the Lord through the spirit, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was also given on the same day, not on thousands of years ago on uh, the giving of the law, but thousands of years ago on the giving of Pentecost, the giving of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit when Jesus died on the cross and then he was uh, he came back, he was resurrected, and he walked the earth for 40 days, and then he departed to heaven. And he told them to wait. He told the disciples to wait and that he would send a helper. He would send the Holy Spirit and they would be filled with boldness and power to be their witnesses in Judea and Jerusalem and to the ends of the world. And so that's what happened. They And he also said... Um, in John 4, to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, again, a Gentile woman, and he said, no longer are you going to worship on this mountain or in Jerusalem, but you will worship 
the Father and me, you will worship him in spirit and in truth. So it's so important for us to know that the, the law was given and we need to celebrate that because we know the Lord through his law. But he also has given the, the Holy Spirit to empower us to to obey the law. Um, and that's, it's amazing that we can have um, the Sermon on the Mount actually living inside of us, that we don't have to hate our brother or our sister and commit murder in our hearts. And we don't have to lust after other women or men and commit adultery. We don't have to fear that because the Holy Spirit comes inside of us that we would have love that transcends hate and we would have faithfulness that transcends lust um and so i just love the holy spirit and i also love the law um because jesus came that we would may have his but by god's grace on our lives grace to forgive us and grace to empower us so i hope you were blessed by following along in the book of ruth uh be uh I would love for you to share this or to hit the subscribe button because we'll have more uh, Bible studies coming your way. Thanks.